Good morning, everybody. There's that your live thing. Let me fix this a little bit. Get a better. Yeah, there we go. Um, ho ho. Good morning, everybody. Um, technical things this morning. Oh, good to see everybody. Penny, Linda, Joelle, uh, Sheila, Catherine. I love to see you chatting. I'll check all this too. Amy, good to see you. Let me see if I dared scroll up and see who came earlier. Chris, mom, you're there. Donna, good to see you. Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful weekend. I hope you had as beautiful a weekend um, where you are as we had in New England. It was an exciting weekend. It was, uh, it was a fall festival weekend. And I posted that on our Facebook group. Um, I wasn't expecting to get one this year because of the year. And it was the only one. And it was in Woodstock, Connecticut, in a very remote uh, part of it. In, uh, it's called the Quiet Corner out there with lots of antique stores. Very, very farmy and so pretty. But it's also where uh, Woodstock is where they have like a huge yearly fair, like agricultural and uh, uh, carnival type fair. Of course, they didn't do that this year. And also that's where Donna Swanson's store is. She's a big name in rug hooking, uh, Whispering Hill. That's also Woodstock. But this was at Roseland Cottage and it was it's a beautiful pink um, Gothic Victorian building. And it belongs to the group called Historic New England, which I belong to. And I love, they protect like dozens of houses around New England that all have special things about them, including like uh, ultra modern houses, but uh, mostly historic houses. And I'll talk more about them another time because they're mentioned in the Atha magazine for this month that just came. And I don't have time for that today because I found so many other things for you today and I have to prioritize our best things. But it was a great fair and it was fun. And the kids came and Jocelyn bought so much expensive soap. I give her money and she just goes straight to soap and candles, which is which is fine. She bought some beautiful soaps. Um, the main reason I wanted to go was because Naomi Nisa Allen was there and her she's got a rug hooking company called um, Raven's Gate Primitives. And we talked, but we never met in person. So I was really excited to go to her stall. And I want to show you what I got. I got something beautiful. A couple of beautiful things. She said it was a busy time. You know, everything is timed with tickets, so it's not super irresponsible to just go. Uh, everything was timed and very precise. I couldn't really go on Saturday because they didn't have times that worked with my insane antiquing one town over. So I ended up going toward the end of the day yesterday and Naomi was there with the most beautiful stall full of wool and kits. Teddy's streaking through. Um, I got this piece of wool, which I think is gorgeous. Well, let me scroll down so I can see if anybody's writing now. There we go. Good morning, Julie. Good morning, Beverly. I got this gorgeous piece of hand painted wool that she did. And it's funny because she said, um, she said, oh, I thought you I thought you did wool. And I do do wool almost every day. But um, I said to her, it's like I've said this before, but it's so true. It's like being a teenager and wanting to wear your friend's clothes instead of your own clothes. It's just somehow better. So I love what I got from her. And then I got this pattern. I don't have hardly anything Christmas going and I haven't thought a lot about Christmas. I've got some um, Halloween stuff coming out, but I got this Christmas pattern from her. I hope you can see this. I think that is so pretty. It's like a simple little thing with the bow and some stars coming down and I see lots of possibilities for filling it in. It reminded me of this pattern I bought last year at Dormill. Um, I don't know why it reminded me of them because they're completely dissimilar, but you could see these two working together, right? You could see me doing something with both of them that they could be hanging near each other and they would really complement each other. So it was so nice to see a rug hooking stall, all kinds of stuff there. You know, the super expensive and beautiful clothing and scarves. I got these earrings there. They're in the shape of an acorn, but do you know what they're made out of? This is This is the first time I've seen this. They're made out of those old biscuit tins, like from the 1900s through maybe the 1960s, they had beautiful graphics on them. And she cuts them to be, um, you know, strategically cut so that you get a nice piece of the picture. But she picked up the acorn is like scalloped on top and it has some words on the bottom. And I just thought so different, you know, that's what it's so nice to go to these fairs for. So different. The only one this year. And that makes me so sad because Normally in New England and hopefully in your area too, there are tons of fall festivals. Um, and it made me think of one years ago when I was still a tour guide before I had the 
kids, we drove by one, you know, by accident on the way to the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge in the Berkshires. I was just talking about that last week because I popped back there. But we drove by on the bus and people were just clinging to the windows because when you looked out, it was just like the world was orange and, and sunflower. And there were signs that said, you know, uh, pumpkin throwing, archery into haystacks. And then there were stalls and stalls of textiles and yarn. And I wasn't into rug hooking yet. I bet there was rug hooking. And I worked it so that while they were at the Norman Rockwell Museum, I was able to call ahead to all the other things we were supposed to do that day and push them back. Somebody stayed open for us in Vermont for an extra two or three hours so that we could squeeze the festival in. And for some people on the tour bus doing something off the itinerary that was so, so fall and so New England was just like the highlight of the tour. But I so miss those days. I know you do too. So miss those days and those good things. They'll all come back. And in the meantime, we're together this way and we have lots of things to look forward to. So otherwise, oh, before I forget, if you watched Cocktail Time on Friday, I just want to make a correction to what I said, um, because we were talking about these felt balls that I dyed, the one inch felt balls that I got off Amazon. I said I was going to put them in like a pool of cedar oil. And Heather wrote and said, and I didn't see it in time, um, don't put them in a pool of cedar oil, just drop them with the dropper. And the cedar thing does come with the dropper. She said, you don't need a ton to protect them from the moth. So I'm gonna, haven't had time this weekend, but I'm gonna drop them just a little bit. So don't do what I said. I was gonna flood them out with cedar oil. Um, so more cedar oil for the next set of balls. Sounds weird. But, um, and I just wanna let you know that I have about nine sweater kits going out today. Um, stripping shoulder with using that little bliss machine so much, but I found some more sweaters and a few more colors so that they all pop and sing beautifully. So those are going out today. Penny, I've got your stuff going out today. I've got your, um, Penny did this beautiful thing. If you, I think you posted it. I'm not sure if you did yet, Penny. It's like a, it's like a huge, busy cat composition that reminds me of like a Laurel Birch crazy colors, lots of colors. So we were going back and forth on what to put in the very small border around the edge what you know things would maybe work best and she went for crazy um bright everything colored kind of tie-dye stuff with every color so i've got this one and that one going out and then the um, yarn that should match it um, unfortunately i broke my winder this weekend penny and um, i have three broken winders now so i need to wind that yarn for you but i'll figure out how to do it today even if i have to do it crazy style um, i'll figure it out and i'll get that out to you so that was the first order of the business. Something else that happened this weekend, um, if you've been on the Facebook page, which if you haven't, hey, we have some new friends on. Donna, I hope I'm saying that right. Linda, I think I said hi. Penny, great. I'll get that out. It'll be great. I just got to wind it. Um, the other thing I did this weekend on the Facebook page, uh, I know not everybody's on Facebook, uh, Rug Hooking um, and Punch Needle Club, I introduced another line and I'm doing it softly and slowly because it's another big one. Nancy Thomas is still popping and booming and she always will. She'll be there, always have new images going. There's some new holiday images for Nancy Thomas up. But I thought it was time to introduce this other line because I found this artist called uh, Jay Schmetz and his company's called, hey Tammy, Mississippi. His company's called um, Schmetz Pets, ideally. And, um, and I wrote to him a couple months ago when we were on the Cape the last time, and it's just been busy. So I didn't want to keep him waiting and thinking I was a complete deadbeat. So um, we started to launch his line, which is amazing. If you've seen it, it's lots of cats, cat, mostly cats and dogs, every breed that you can think of, except a Labradoodle, which someone was asking for. I didn't see that. Great to see you, Jennifer. Hey, Penny. But um yeah, everything. Also like bears, there's bears coming, roosters, besides the rooster on the toilet, there's other country type animals, anything you can think of. Um, the shark there with the cell phone is there. But I started hooking one of them to show you. They're very whimsical, lots of cats drinking wine and dogs, reading, cooking, doing needlepoint, doing all kinds of human things. And they're very comical and they're super, super, super folky. So I made a deal with him for the entire line and his eBay store is over 6,000 things. So this is an ongoing project um, for us here, getting everything online. But if you love animals and you want something funny to work on for the holidays or for a gift, you can almost certainly get the breed you're looking for. I started doing this cat. 
I've hardly gotten anywhere with it, but I've gotten the background cat drinking a glass of wine. I've got the pink grounding in and the background going in the wine bottle. I've got part of the cat. I've only got the one eye. So he's looking like Igor from a uh, young Frankenstein right now, but it's got a lot of bright colors. It's another dim day here. Thanks, Elizabeth. But I thought it was fun and it's something different. And I love having other people on um, ribboncandyhooking.com who are folky and fun and different. And I want you to have a choice, not just of my stuff, but everybody's stuff. So I got going on another book, as you can imagine. I know you love the history part of it, or I hope you love, hey, Julie. I hope you love the history part of it. Um, and so I got going on this book in bed last night. I'm so distracted because I have so many things to tell you and I know I'm only gonna get part way through. Thanks, Jennifer. But um, this is the book. Now this isn't the book I normally go for. I normally go for you know the Schiffers and the uh, rug hooking publisher books and the really die hard books. This is more like a coffee book, which isn't has not traditionally been my thing. And I hadn't looked at it yet, although I've had it for years. Um, I had it before I even hooked rugs. I was the reason I got it is because this author, who is Leslie Lindsley, um, I'll show you the cover. Um, is mo mostly does she does a lot of nonfiction writing, or she did uh, um, in like eighties, nineties, um, maybe a little bit further in. But um, she does mostly patchwork. Um, she does textile, but mostly patchwork and quilting books. So. Um, I have those too, which is weird. And I also bought this because I must have recognized the name and said, oh, I like her. This book is the crown jewel for me so far of rug hooking books. It's just called Hooked Rugs, uh, an American folk art with 10 patterns. I'm not even there yet. I'm, I'm still in the introduction and I've got more to tell you um, than I can even do in this episode. So this is the spelling, Leslie Lindsley, L-I-N-S-L-E-Y. If you get this book, I'll certainly be looking at this again tomorrow. Amazon does deliver the next day, but you don't have to go nuts. This book is so good. It's unbelievable. And for some, oh, you need a Rottweiler. There are lots of Rottweilers, Tammy. There's a lot. I have the link to his eBay page, but I also have, um, um, if you go on R Ribbon Candy Hooking, there's about 80 to 90 already listed. So this book is just over the top. In terms of the history at the beginning, I've just gotten through the introduction. I've been in it for a couple of hours and it is over the top. So the curious thing is that she doesn't typically write about hooked drugs and this is the one time that she did, but man, she killed it. She did stuff that we haven't heard about or talked about yet, at least here. Maybe stuff you know about, but stuff that's new to me. So I'm just gonna start telling, theming this out for you. She's got, being a coffee table book, she's got some gorgeous, um, pictures in here. Look at this little welcome mat up on top. Oh God. I mean, it is truly a coffee table book. She, it, it's so glorious and colorful, but it's so solid with the history and the examples. Look at this. This reminds me, um, of like motif number one in, uh, Rockport, beautiful CC. It's not, but it looks like it, but this is, this is, this is good. This is really good. So Look at her collection of hook drugs at the beginning before it even starts. I know we're getting a weird glare with the glint of sun that there is, but my word, it's a lot. I mean, she knows her rugs. Hey, Carol. Hi from Mass. It is a good day. It's just not very bright here in Connecticut, and I wish I had a bit more sun for you. But this book starts out with talking about rug hooking as we do and as we have and as we will. Um, past, present, future, everything, but mostly past. And she she makes some really solid points that I think are worth reiterating because um, she's looking at everything from the point of view of, of not a full-time rug hooker. And she's talking about the influences and the evolution there, uh, uh, the evolution of hooking. And, <clears throat> and she starts by saying, the genesis of rug hooking can be traced to 1840 in the Eastern seaboard. And the craft has changed little since that time. Now that in itself stopped my heart because if you think about it, it really hasn't. We're still sitting around doing the same things that people were doing in 1840, especially now. It really drove the point home while I was thinking about that sentiment and stripping the sweaters to make the kits for you all. I was thinking that is the, the purest, purest form of hooking, isn't it? When you're cut, cutting up old clothes and you're gonna hook a primitive design with them. It could be 1840 and you could be sitting by some massive hearth in some beautiful old 
how solid wood and um, the smells and the light coming through the window. And I mean, it's just so atmospheric thinking that we're doing something that has been done almost exactly the same way for almost 200 years. I mean, you can say that of a lot of crafts, but I just thought it was such a solid point and such a good starting point. She talks about the history and says, when pattern makers began selling pre-stenciled patterns on burlap, designs became more formal and stiff. Now think about that too. That is so true. When you think about the primitive stuff that we've looked at in few, in uh, past coffee times, you know, the really, if you think about the Magdalena uh, Brian or Ebby stuff, like the, the really rough looking dogs and horses that are true folk art. And then you think about the patterns that came next, which are also beautiful, but apples and oranges, right? Completely different. How formal they became with their big borders and their big scrolls and central motif and everything being perfect. As soon as patterns were being commercialized, Edward Sands Frost, Ebenezer Ross, um, they became, as she said, formal and stiff, which isn't a bad thing. It is just the next sort of evolution. It's, it's important to think of it that way, that it's not better or worse, it's a different style of. It gave us another choice, something else to work toward. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, it's worth saying, who would buy these patterns in the 19th century or now that are the more formal patterns that are commercially printed and done, you know, for a lot of people, using a pattern like that is just a point of departure because you can then take it in whatever direction you want it. You can do a lime green background, a zigzag zebra background, a cheetah background. You could do it shaded in the way it was intended and shown. I, I don't want to say intended, but shown. Um, or you can do it your way. So there were always people through this time. Most people did it the way that they thought they were supposed to because most people like rules. And rug hooking after the commercial commercialization of it was being taught more from woman to woman and home to home and town to town. And for that reason, you were taught how to do the shading and everything else. But for some people, and we've seen examples in coffee time, I have examples of rugs that are these formal designs, but are done in a very graphic way. So you can have it both ways. It was just sort of a suggestion. And she goes on to talk about uh, people who I had never heard of that you probably have, but I hadn't. And I got really excited late at night uh, with the phone and with looking up stuff. Uh, and then again, really early this morning. But um, she talks about a man named Homer Eaton Keyes, who was the editor. He was a teacher at Dartmouth. So that's one of the Ivy League schools in New Hampshire. That's the only one in New Hampshire. But it's one of our Ivy Leagues. And um, he later became the editor of Antiques Magazine, which is still around. Now, I really regret um, selling like a huge lot of Antiques Magazine a, a year or two ago because I looked at them and I thought I was done. And it turns out that he, his special pet love was hooked rugs. So he did lots of articles about hooked rugs in Antiques Magazine, being the editor he could. So now I think I'm going to be doing an eBay thing, like a expensive eBay thing and searching back on the articles that he did because, you know, we were talking about like the 20s, 30s. They'd be full of interesting stuff for us to think about and look at. So I looked up him a little bit. And then she also mentions uh, people who in the 20th century, early 20th century, made a really marked difference to rug hooking. Of course, we know Pearl McGowan. That's the one that really stands out as the pioneer. But she also dropped these two names that I didn't know. And I had to start my wild, my wild chase. Louise Hunter Zeiser and Edith Dana. Now, I couldn't find anything on Edith Dana, um, but Louise Hunter Zeiser had put out, um, I have a, I, I just ordered like 15 minutes ago on eBay, a reprint of her publication, which was a, a book, a very thick book. Nobody says how many pages, but it was quite thick, surprisingly, a catalog of rug hooking designs. And the few pictures that I saw on eBay showing what the book contained they were like promo gowns, but they were a lot more lush, like like super feathery, heavy, heavy borders, uh, a little bit of color. You know, some pages were in color, but they were different. They, they were in the style of promo gown, meaning that they looked like um, early to middle 20th century rug designs, commercial designs, um, but they were different. So there were more copies of it on there. It goes between the 20s, 30s, 40s, that kind of thing. There were two or three more copies. Again, her name is Louise Hunter Zeiser, Z-E-I-S-E-R. And I'm guessing there's also text in that book, and I can't wait to read it. But it should come in a few days. And, of course, I'm going to share that with you and show you what that looks like. It's an old catalog. And, again, scarce. 
So it's good to get that uh, if you can, if you're interested, because it's so good and important to document the people who have had a huge um, role in the evolution of, of rug hooking. To me, it is. And I think to you, it is because you watch the show. But she's going to be a big name for us. And she's a name that I am sorry that I haven't come across till now. But now now we can catch up together. So um, so I ordered that, needless to say. Um, I'm going to come back to the Antiques Magazine um, tie-in if I have time at the end because I ordered something else that's going to be really excited for us that ties into that. But the other name she drops later on, I'm going to just read you this passage. And again, if you're just tuning in, I'm reading an excerpt from the book Hooked Rugs, an American Folk Art by Leslie Lindsley. And she's now talking about a woman called Helen Albee, A-L-B-E-E, -E, just like the playwright. Um, and Helen Albee is a designer. Now, this is going to be big for us to think about and look at and uh, ruminate. It, this is inspiring stuff. So she says, one such designer, she's talking about the people who were designers and produced commercial patterns uh, during the early 20th century. Hey, Olivia. Um, so she says, one such designer was Mrs. Helen R. Albee. Isn't it funny how they always used such specific like last names or, you know, using their husband's first name in place of their own. I'm glad we know she's called Helen at least. A New Hampshire woman who established a home industry at the start of the 1900s with the goals of introducing better designs and providing a source of income for local farm women. Now, this is very reminiscent of the Grenfell mission. Remember that episode um, in Labrador, Canada. So um, this, is, this is a theme that we're going to see recurring in the very early 20th century, oh. these sort of pioneering rug hooking artists. Um, the dog's hacking something up, sorry. He sounds like Beaker from the Muppets. Um, this is a theme we're going to see and we're going to revisit again. <laughs> but rug hooking had never fallen out of fame or, uh, favor in the less affluent areas that it had in, as it had in other places. We've talked about this too, how with um, industrialization in the 19th century, of course, the um, uh, 19th century in America, uh, is the Industrial Revolution, and we have a lot of new industries and a lot of choices. And in terms of shopping, things are a lot cheaper. And most people will, for the sake of status and looks and keeping up with the Joneses, who indeed was like Edith Wharton's family, just incidental trivia, um, most people would buy stuff if they could. But in really remote local farming areas, they didn't have that option. So they were still with their peddler and they were doing handcrafts. So in these types of areas, rug cooking never fell out of favor. Hey, Chris, you have Louise's catalog. Penny Hannon has done her rugs. Okay, Penny Hannon. Um, look at the thread with me so you can see the spelling of these. They were featured in an old rug hooking magazine and has a website as a certified McGowan teacher. So I'm going to look that up later. I didn't get that far in the rabbit hole yet. That's great information, Chris. Thank you. I'm going to look that up too to follow up on her. Um, and maybe I'll roll that together when the catalog comes because I can't wait to see. I, there's only like four images online from that catalog and they were gorgeous. I can't wait to see the rest of them. So um, we're talking about the rugs that people were producing in these remote areas. And she said, they tended to be crudely designed and made of fabric so worn and threadbare that they uh, were suitable only for modest uses. So in other words, they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't really rugged and they did not stand the test of time in terms of being able to look at them now. But Mrs. Albee said the decorative forms used, this is her own idea at this point. I'm just going to insert the idea that Mrs. Albee is one of the many people in the early 20th century who helped the art of rug hooking a lot, the craft of rug hooking. Um, but she is seeing herself um, and we are seeing her uh, uh, historically as a tastemaker. So this is always a thing, isn't it? I mean, you, this is the same with the Grenfell mission, right? Um, somebody coming into an area and saying, I like what you're doing. You've got a lot of technical skills, but I think you can make better rugs and I'm going to help you design better rugs. So this is when we get these regional tweaks where, you know, suddenly the taste of one person begins to reflect a region. Um, and this is the reason that I love department stores, particularly window display, because the idea of using your medium, whether it's uh, window display design or rug hooking designing, whatever it is, using what you do to influence the taste of others, particularly people that don't have an opinion and they're looking to you for an opinion, you're in a position of great power. But luckily, you know, she's very kind and helpful and she's going to boost the economy of these people like crazy. But she will uh, sort of um, transpose her taste 
um, onto the region because the rugs will be known from this point on as Abenaki rugs. Um, and I ordered that book too. I ordered that book too. So that's on the way. This whole Ellen Alby thing, Helen Alby thing is not over. It's just the beginning. So Helen Alby said, the decorative forms used by the Indians, meeting the Native Americans, as by all primitive peoples, appealed to me greatly. Yet their symbolism uh, was meaningless to us, meaning we really didn't have the Rosetta Stone uh, to help us with the language of what everything meant inside the uh, rug design or composition. So she said, um, the only thing to do was to think myself back to the viewpoint of a primitive craftsman and let the designs grow of themselves from clear and simple thought. Ultimately, the rugs made in the Pocatic, New Hampshire area under Mrs. Albee's direction were considered the most beautiful of her time. Her success led to the establishment of similar cottage industries uh, in other parts of the U.S. and Canada. I, I inserted that part uh, and tied in very tightly with the arts and crafts movement. So in other words, her taste is um, she loves primitive Native American design, but she feels that the their rugs are meaningless to look at. So in place of copying a design, she starts making her own designs that are inspired by Native American design. There's not a lot of images on the internet and I just ordered the book this morning, but I'm gonna show you some of the images of her rugs, the patterns, not the finished pieces. This one anyway, uh, very Native American in style. These are really blurry. They're super bad quality pictures, but you can get the feel for what she liked and what she did and what these Abenaki rugs are going to look like. So they look a little bit Southwestern. Um, you can see that she's crossing in terms of design with, uh, for example, the border more European or Asian, right, in, in origin. But you can see that she's crossing what she knows of exotic rugs with primitive Native American designs. There was only one that I could find quickly before coffee time that was in color. And I thought this was just over the top. Chris, I wonder if this is one of the ones um, that you were just mentioning that um, Penny that Peggy's done. I'm gonna have to check. Good morning, Packy Knits Design. Good morning, Heather. Oh, your husband is Abenaki. That's really, that's that's a cool twist too. But I'm gonna get this book and we're gonna learn more about it. I know you can hear my stomach growling on the um, excellent microphone that I bought, but I can't help it. I haven't had a chance to eat because I was going down the Helen Alby um, rabbit hole. So, um, so this is gonna be a big thing when this book comes. I'm dying to see, you know, because I've seen in Rug Hooking Magazine uh, past issues, examples of rugs that are very heav heavily inspired by Native American designs and symbolism. And I'm wondering how many of them now are Helen Albee rugs or how many are inspired by Helen Albee rugs. But what a thing for a person at the beginning of the 20th century to be thinking in terms of, you know, we talk about thinking outside the box, not doing something floral and scrolly, or even doing something sort of Asian or what they you know, would call Oriental at that time, um, but doing something completely different. And, you know, she's from New Hampshire. She's not from the Midwest. Of course, there's Native American people everywhere, but it's not typical at all in New England to be pulling a lot of decorative art during this time from Native American culture. So this is really something and it's exciting. I can't wait to get that book. So I think I'm only gonna have time for one more sentiment with my last two minutes. I'm still on the first two pages of this book. This is how good this book is. Wait till you see the images and the chapters coming up. We'll look at those tomorrow. Any comments on the McAdoo rug on eBay? The horses pattern, the McAdoo rug on eBay. Any comments on, ooh, is there a McAdoo rug on eBay? Is that what you mean? Did a McAdoo rug turn up on eBay? Holy mackerel. Let me check that real fast. Am I the ding dong that did not look up McAdoo rugs this morning? Let me check real fast. Um, and then I'm gonna leave you with one sentiment. McAdoo rug, holy moly's. By the way, um, this weekend I bought um, a half finished George Wells rug. Remember we were talking about George Wells twice last week. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Oh boy, there is one. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. <gasps> you all are on it, yes, you all are on it. Let me see if I can pull it up for you. This is it, can you see that at all? Oh, it's real bad with the phone glare. It's two horses with horseshoes in the corners and like a patched gridded background. 
Good Lord. Thank you so much. See, it's so good for us to be together and share info. Vintage McAdoo hook drug, hand dyed by McAdoo, horses and horseshoes, as is with tag. Who? four hours left. Decide whether you can do this. Uh, this is a piece of history. Definitely a piece of history. $510 plus uh, $19 shipping. There are 53 bids. Um, so if you're going to go in there, I wouldn't recommend sniping. Go in there with a huge punch because it's going to go for a lot. You know, McAdoo rugs usually go for this amount. Thank you so much for, for mentioning that. I'm so excited that you mentioned that. I can't, I just can't bid on it. I've been buying too much stuff and, uh, you know, the kid, the kids want to eat too. Selfish, I know. But uh, this is a gorgeous rug. I wish I could show it to you better. I should have printed it out this morning. I'm sorry. It's got a lot of color in it. Um, but that, thank you so much. Hey, if you're bidding on it, good for you. Good luck. I hope you get it. Um, anyway, I'll sign off for today. I was going to do a little bit on dating, but I'm coming back to this book tomorrow. And we're going to enjoy this so immensely together. This is just a golden, golden book. I hope you had a great weekend. I'm going to be watching the end of that auction. It's so neat to see what things are selling for. And it's so good that we know about them, right? We know that this is important. We know why it's important. We know the whole sort of pedigree and the, and the, and the company timeline of McAdoo. We know Amy Oxford is holding the patterns now and she's putting them out as, as often as she can. Um, but there's a lot of them and the rugs are scarce as hen's teeth. So, hey, if you're in the budget and you love horses, this is really cool primitive one. Good luck if you're bidding. I'll be back to you tomorrow. And in the meantime, have a great day. We'll see you in the morning.